The Ashwick was coming. When he had first heard the excited holiday chatter, Francis had wondered after the beast that his village so diligently catered to. His own questions were the ones on everyone's mind. Would it come through this year? Were they to be blessed by its tracks on holiday morn? Was the beast responsible for the flowing wassail and feast that they've no doubt awake to tomorrow? The winter feasting was much looked forward to as the night stretched long and the ground lost its green. Elders would sit in their rickers and point shaking fingers at him and say, Don't forget! The present is where you live, my boy! Never forget! Here and now was the true reason for the winter feasting. It was a yearly reminder that while the past is very sweet, and the future a delicacy, today is your meat and bread. Eat well and stay full. And every year, as if to herald the feasting, came the Ashwick. Every village knew of the beast, elusive and strange. Although its white fur should have hid it well in the frozen landscape, its fiery branches would have it seen in the densest storms. Wick ever burning, the embers glow through the crystal clear surface of its eyes, its nose, its hooves. Truly, a fearsome beast. And while no one knew if it was indeed the reason for their laden tables, it seemed it must be so somehow. Francis's village was honored by its glowing tracks left through their little frozen town, but that was years ago. Still yet, everyone would clear the way and keep indoors from sundown to sunup to entice it to come through once more and bless them all. Snug in his bed, he listened to Papa's sleeping growls while his eyes watched the snowflakes cluster at the edges of his window. Tomorrow, the village would awake to a holiday bounty inexplicably brought to them all. The winter feasting was joyous indeed, but it had little that interested him. His cousins would frolic, and he with them, but the food was often too rich, and the drink too strong. Roasted lamb was hearty, and the sweet bread brought his tongue to his lips, but they were gone so fast, he had little opportunity to enjoy them. His next meal would most likely be the beef and stew that remained after the best of the feast was picked clean. His stomach growled and he cursed the fast. Perhaps Mama wouldn't notice a missing egg on the morn, since there would be plenty. Stealing away to the icebox, he sent thanks for Papa's buzzing breaths that hid his steps from Mama's ear. Just as he was about to grab the handle, a light outside stayed his hand. Its burning orange stained the cabinets and floors, and Francis wondered what fool walked by torch on the village path so blatantly. If anyone should notice, they would certainly be scolded for scaring away the Ashwick. Deciding that a peek might satisfy, he hopped up on the counter to peer at the fool. But it was no fool. It was no one at all, in fact. There in the snow, were glowing tracks. Francis blinked hard at the sight so that it might disappear quickly, if it wasn't imagining. But the tracks remained. Empty belly forgotten, he scurried to the door, wincing at the creaking hinges. Before he knew what his feet had done, he was on the main path staring after the trail of glowing hoof prints. Now, it wasn't that Francis hadn't believed in the Ashwick. It was only that so few had gotten a glimpse of the beast, and the tracks it had left before were from a time he couldn't possibly know. Seeing the proof now, he could hardly contain himself, clouding the air with his breaths as he jogged after the tracks. The Ashwick had obviously come through already, so what harm would it do to have a look? He may never get another chance, after all. The trail led out of the village and he was just about ready to give up, bare toes stiff and cursing their lack of covering. But before he could turn back, a shape made itself known in the distance, silhouette cut by an orange glow. 
Once again, his feet cursed him for running forward onto the frozen lake of the plains. Wind and white whipped at his face, and he ducked his chin, pressing on until he heard the cracking of ice. Afraid that his meager weight had somehow broken the thick winter sheet, he froze. A voice cut through the rushing sounds of the great wider plains. Come, child, and know me better. Looking up, he was startled to see the Ashwick just a few meters away. Its fiery eyes gazed calmly at him with seemingly no indication it would bolt away like everyone said it would if one happened upon it. He hadn't expected that the Ashwick would look like a goat. Although it stood at twice the height of a normal one, it looked young, beard not even as long as his family's Billy. Francis took a stumbled step back as he finally pulled his eyes from the menacing creature to see what things standing at its side had spoken to him. A giant. Young, it looked like. A boy, like him, but as tall and wide as his papa. The giant was rosy-cheeked, with hair as fair as the Ashwick's. On its brow, it wore a crown of holly, and in its hand was a branch of mistletoe, which it pointed at Francis. Robed in red, the giant was both regal and ethereal. Come, child, and know me better, it repeated in its jolly coo. Francis inched closer, weary of the thing which towered over him. He looked up at the branch of mistletoe hanging over his head, frozen dew sparkling on it. At the sound of approaching, Francis returned his eyes to the giant, who gently patted the child on the head and gave a soft kiss to his brow before returning to the Ashwick's side. It climbed aboard the beast and trotted past Francis. I am much to do this night, child. Do you join me? The boy quietly gasped at the invitation, an old warning about strange ghosts awaying folks who weren't careful ringing in his ears. Shall I join you for an eternity then, O giant? Nay, child, it answered, for I am the here and now, the spirit of present. Come and know me better, child, for after this night I am gone. So Francis did, taking place in front of the spirit who had plenty of wassail and lamb and bread to satiate a boy's hunger or thirst. The warmth of the Ashwick thawed his toes. And so when they came to the first house, Francis chose not to follow the giant within. It seemed but a moment, the space of one blink to another, but then the giant was returned, and the house full and twinkling. Through the window, Francis could see the feast laid out for the family to find on the morn. Do you know them, spirit? Must it be so? They know me. The spirit was good company, laughing freely and speaking in rhyme. Its words were often unknowable to the boy, but nonetheless, warm. Francis found himself unable to dwell on unkind things in its presence. House after house they went, and as they did, the boy noticed the spirit wasn't the youth he had first met that night. Nor was the Ashwick still a goat for that matter. Just as the feasts appeared in hazy moments, so too did the young spirit become a mature one, and the goat become a fox. Then, just as the spirit had become bearded, the fox was a deer. Then, just as the deer became a boar, the spirit was an elder. House after house, change after change. Still. It never seemed to Francis that he spoke to anyone other than the same white giant he acquaintanced earlier that night. At last they reached the final house, the spirit making his merry inside. But suddenly, the Ashwick wobbled under Francis, its great snout quivering once before it collapsed altogether in the snow. Scurrying off, the boy examined the beast fretfully, but nothing could be done. It was dead. Turning to the house, the boy saw the spirit emerge and said, Spirit, quick! The Ashwick has fallen! Ho ho ho! It exclaimed as cheerfully as ever. Worry not, child. Turn eyes to the beast as it is now. At the spirit's behest, 
Francis faced the Ashwick once again, but instead of a dead boar with flaming tusks, he was stood before a great skeletal horse, its flame dimmed by a white veil and saddle. Together, they boarded the beast and took off for Francis's village, eating and drinking as they went. What is the purpose, spirit? Good cheer, child, said the old giant. Be merry and eat well, for now is ever fleeting. It is so, spirit, the boy nodded. But what of children? Be they not of merriment at every morn until every dusk? Nay, it is so. But spirit, the winter feasting is not for them. The meat is seasoned, but many mouths make scarce. The drink is strong, but much so for one such as I. Cannot the children be a thought on this day as well? The spirit placed its hand on Francis's shoulder, a cheerful laugh ringing across the plains as it replied. I know it, and so it is. Look for me in a year's time, then. And when they had reached the village, and Francis had bid farewell to the dying spirit and steed, he crept back into bed with none the wiser. On the morn, he made merry like never he had before in all the days after. And when the year had passed, and the winter feasting was upon them once more, Francis found that more than food awaited he and his that day. Toys and baubles and puzzles and games all abounded, and the children wondered at this as much as their drink-warmed parents. But whatever the reason, it was so on every year after, and Francis, for all his days, kept merry in his heart. <laughs>